One of the things I want to do today is, now that we've come to the end of Deuteronomy, I want to walk you through a few chapters or a few texts looking at the Apostle Paul. And what did Paul, how did Paul think about Deuteronomy? How did he use Deuteronomy? Because as we know, within basic Christianity, and I'm being using it at large here, basic Christianity is not as much concerned with what Moses said, maybe even less with what Yeshua said, but they really want to know, what did Paul say? So at the end of, at the end of a Deuteronomy here, I want to look at how the Apostle Paul used the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, so I want us to go through and watch how he viewed Deuteronomy. Yes? Yes, there is. At the end of the Torah cycle, yeah, there is uh, Kazak, Kazak, Vanit, Kazak. Um, be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. Yes, we should have done that. You're right. There's a, he was saying that there's traditionally there's a blessing that goes with completing a Torah cycle, or actually completing any book of the Torah. So we are, we've just completed the reading, and we will start Genesis, but we just read chapter 33 and chapter 34. So when we think of Paul, with regards to Deuteronomy, let me make a couple of opening statements. With regards to Deuteronomy, Paul, from what we can tell, first of all, he likes to use the Septuagint. He likes the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Why? We, first of all, I know that Paul knows Hebrew and Aramaic, but he already has a translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. So many of his quotations of the Hebrew scripture are from the Septuagint. And let me just add this, that at times there are some differences, subtle differences between the Masoretic text, Hebrew, and the Septuagint Greek. At times, there are some subtle differences. Some additions and some rearranging. Now, not only does he like the Septuagint, but Paul's material that he, where he quotes Deuteronomy and uses Deuteronomy comes from chapters 5 through 32. We don't see anything from 33 and 34, and we don't see anything from ch chapters 1 to 4. But we do see material from him quoting from chapter 5 through 32. All right, so take the handout that I gave you and go with me to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. We're going to look at how the Apostle Paul, now that we've come to the end of Deuteronomy, how does he use Deuteronomy? Look at Romans chapter 13, and we begin our reading in verse 8. We'll begin in verse 8. He says this, the Apostle Paul, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now we have to stop and ask ourselves, what does it mean to fulfill the law? Does it mean that once you've... Is it like fulfilling an order? Most people think that fulfilling is like doing away with it. Because let's say I get an order and I fulfill the order. I fill out and give them what they ordered, and now I'm done with the order. Is that what's meant by fulfill? No, it's not. It has nothing to do with completing it. It has to do with the continuation of doing this. It has nothing to do with completing it and saying it's done. We'll see why that's not the case here in just a moment. He'll use it again. Look at this, verse 9. This is Paul speaking, Romans 13, verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. Notice he doesn't list the first four. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. 
Again, love is the fulfillment of the law. Again, but not because I can stop loving my neighbor. It's not as if one day I can say, well, I didn't murder anybody today, but tomorrow, since I fulfilled it yesterday, I can murder somebody today. That seems reasonable. I was good yesterday. No, you can't, you can't say, well, because I did something good one day, I can undo what I did the next day. Now, notice here that the order, here's what tells us this is the Septuagint. This is the Septuagint version of Deuteronomy 5. Because the order, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, the order of those tells us that this is from the Septuagint of Deuteronomy chapter 5. So we know that he's using Deuteronomy chapter 5. And he's specifically focusing on these commandments. Now notice, why, notice what Paul does in good Jewish fashion. Do you remember what we said earlier about linking text together? Where does you shall love your neighbor as yourself come from? Leviticus 19.18. So, and what was Leviticus 19.18 about? It had the Ten Commandments. So now he's just quoted from Deuteronomy 5 in the Septuagint, which is all these commandments. Now he's going to link it up with Leviticus 19, which is also about the Ten Commandments. So he's linking up two texts that dealt with the Ten Commandments and putting them together. Very, very rabbinic way of linking. So he says, you know, here, here are the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, false witness, coveting. If there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's putting you back to Leviticus 19. And anybody reading Leviticus 19 knew that this also had the Ten Commandments. And it wasn't as if one could say, well, now that I, like I said earlier, now that I've done the commandments, I can, I fulfill them. Therefore, I can, I can go back and, and the next day I can do something completely different. No. It's an ongoing fulfillment. It's an ongoing process of obedience. It's not as if one just completes the process in a day and says, okay, now I'm, I'm good to go do something different the next day. But Paul is here. He's quoting the Ten Commandments. Not the, first, not the first four, but he's quoting it out of Deuteronomy 5. We know that by the order. If you look at the order of Deuteronomy 5 and these commandments, out of the Septuagint, the Greek text, that tells us where he's quoting from. And he's linking it up with Leviticus chapter 19, because if you read Leviticus chapter 19, then you see the connection between the commandments. See where I'm going with this? So Paul doesn't see this as done away with. Here in Romans, he's reiterating the commandments again from Deuteronomy. So he has, it looks to me like a very positive view of Deuteronomy. Okay, He's not saying, hey, look, we can just do away with these. He's saying, look, if you love, here's the way you demonstrate love. By fulfilling these commandments, ongoing Questions or comments? This is Paul's, I'm just showing you the first usage of Deuteronomy with the commandments. Anybody? Questions, comments? Yes. Yeah. I know that, Paul's, I know that Paul has been in the synagogue. We know that. And we know that he goes to the synagogue um, evidenced by the fact that from the book of Acts he goes to the synagogues. So we know that. Um, and Paul's, Paul's knowledge and understanding of the liturgy seems to me that he's, he's very well aware of what's going on in the synagogue. Um, the, to answer your question, there's two reasons why one would use the Septuagint. First of all, ease. It's easy. For this reason, you already have a Greek translation. You're writing this in Greek. You already have a Greek translation and you're writing in Greek. So, it, 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 huh? He's writing to diaspora Jews that use Greek. So, they're already using Greek. So, in a sense, he's already got a text that is ready-made without, without having to take it from Hebrew into Greek. I already have it done. I already have a translation that's done that work for me. The second reason is, at times, that Paul likes to use the Septuagint 
and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, was there are times where the Septuagint, now this may bother us a little bit, there's, where, there's times where the Septuagint makes explicit what the Masoretic text implies. So it likes to, especially at places where there are Messianic prophecies, the Masoretic text will be a little more opaque and a little more vague. The Septuagint oftentimes will draw this out and, and maybe add a phrase. And it will also sometimes um, yeah, give a little more ex explanation, add a few words that will clarify. So you already have a ready clarification in the Septuagint if you want to make your point. And I can show you places where Paul um, used the Septuagint because it it had a little more than what he a little more stuff to work with. Sure. Yes. Sure, sure, yeah, and I would I would hold to that. So yeah, the the use of the Greek text allows Paul to have a text ready at hand that he can use that they're already familiar with and ha already been using. In other words, if you use a translation that people are already familiar with and already using, especially your Greek speaking Jews, um, your diaspora Jews that are already have learned Greek and are using Greek on a, on a, in business, it's a business language. So. Um, they're already using it. <laughs> I, oh no, the New King James. He was using New King James. Um, all right. So, any other questions or comments? Yes. The Septuagint was written in 200 BC. Although we have, when I say Septuagint, we have what, what we will call four recensions of the Septuagint. There were later on after the first one. There were modifications in four other family groups of, of translation from Hebrew into Greek. And there are some variants between the, the four or five different types of Septuagint. Um, so we have more than just one. For instance, there's what's called Theodotion, Aquila, Symmachus. Then we have the initial, tra initial translation. So there's four at least. Okay, This gets a little technical, but bottom line is... For the most part, they agree. You have some places where there's a little bit of disagreement. So what you want to do is, whenever you're looking at a, looking at a, at a quote, you want to go back and say, where did it come from? Did it come from Dead Sea Scrolls? Did it come from Masoretic text type? Did it come from Septuagint? You want to go back and try to figure out where, what text are they using? That's a, one of the first things you want to do. And what we can tell from Paul's usage here, based on the ordering of this, is that he's using, the, he's using first of all, Deuteronomy 5, not Exodus 20, and he's using Septuagint, Deuteronomy 5. Yes? That's, act, that's it. Not a coincidence. You can't, it has to be that order. It has to be because of that order. Nobody else has that order. Yes? Right. Well, we have to remember this about synagogues. Synagogues were not just places of worship. They were town halls and community centers. So you could have more than one thing going on in a synagogue. So it wasn't as just as if, well, the, yes, they met there for prayer and for the reading of scriptures, but you could have had more than one thing going on in a synagogue during a week than just the meeting for worship. And so your diaspora Jews, the Jews that were in dispersion, they had to use Greek as part of the, as part of the business language of the day. So it made sense to have a text of the scriptures. And remember where these originate. The Septuagint originates in Alexandria, Egypt. Okay, so you have Jews that are there that want the, 
they're speaking Greek already, and they say, look, we want to have the Hebrew scriptures in a translation that we, of a language that we're already using. So it made, it made sense to have the, the Hebrew scriptures then translated into Greek. Um, and then when the apostolic writings come along, here's, the, here's what, we, here's what we're, we're left with. We don't have any manuscripts other than Matthew, and those that we have today are late for a Hebrew vorlaga, a Hebrew base text, where you can say, well, we have it in Hebrew for, for the apostolic scriptures. It's only Matthew that we have any kind of history of, uh, of a text-based history regarding uh, a Hebrew original. Um, what we do have is the Greek, we have tons of Greek manuscripts. So we have to go with those, otherwise we're left with really trying to rework and go back, and that's that's going to be difficult. Yeah. We have we have the um, targums. The word targum is an Aramaic word, and the targums were um, Aramaic paraphrases of the Hebrew scriptures. Of the Hebrew scriptures, we don't have anything that we can. Nothing major of Aramaic related to the apostolic scriptures. So what's interesting is, oftentimes, in the, in the apostolic scriptures, when there is a quote or a reference to a particular Hebrew text, it's coming out of the Targums, because what the Targums did was this. They would quote the, they would quote the Hebrew text and then make a commentary on it. So out of that commentary, it was like a running commentary, out of that commentary sometimes you can see where the apostolic writers will take something from that and then incorporate it into the apostolic scriptures. So I just think we have to be careful that we're going to have to deal with Greek because that's what we have. Clearly we have the, the vast majority of what we have for the apostolic scriptures is Greek. And that's okay. I mean, I think we have to work with it. That's what we're left with. Yes. Right. And modern Hebrew is quite an eclectic mix. It's quite the melting pot of different languages. So even there you're dealing with some interesting things trying to, to piece all that together. All right. So I want you to see. Now go with me to 1 Corinthians. We're in Romans. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now this is the Apostle Paul. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to go to verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 3. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do all the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. So here's Paul's point. You know, look, if you plant a vineyard, you're going to benefit from it. If you, plant, you know, tend a flock, you're going to benefit from it. Verse 8. Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the Torah say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And he... he he keys us here to the fact, you know, it's written in the law of Moses. Is it oxen God is concerned about? He's asking that rhetorically. And the answer is, he's trying to say, is it, is it oxen only that God is worried about? That's the idea here. Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, Paul answers. This is written that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Now, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 25. 
I mean, talk about an obscure verse. Numbers, chap Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25, and look at verse 4. I mean, it seems... Look at the context here. If you're looking at Deuteronomy 25, look at the context. So let's start with verse 1. If there's a dispute between men and they come to court, the judges may judge them, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Then it shall be if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, and the judge will cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence according to his guilt. For with a certain number of blows, now look at this, 40 blows he may give, and no more, lest he should exceed this and beat him with, with many blows above these, and your brother be humiliated in your sight. So you can never be beaten more than, you know, thrashed more than 40 times. So this is why you'll see in the literature they did 39, just to make sure they don't get the 40. So the third, Paul says, you know, twice I was, twice 39 stripes, you know, okay. But they didn't go to 40. Then verse 4, here it is. You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. All right, there you go. Then the next, verse 5. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, it's something completely different. You're, I mean, it's kind of this, it seems ad hoc. I suggest that it's probably, let me suggest that it's probably not as ad hoc as we might think, first of all. But notice what he says. Do not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. Okay, so what's the point in Deuteronomy 25.4? Tell me what you think the point is. Okay. Okay, but, and I agree, but this, does God, so here's the question then, does God care about animals? All right. The animals working for you, threshing out grain, and as it's threshing out grain, you muzzle the ox. Why do you muzzle the ox? So it won't eat. And it will keep moving, right? So it keeps working. But as it's working, it's getting hungry because it's putting out energy. So he says, unmuzzle this ox and let him benefit from a little bit of the work that he's doing. Okay? He gets to benefit from the fact that he's threshing this grain. Now, Paul then uses, here's the key. He uses a rabbinic method of argumentation, which is called cow. Vachomer, argument from light to heavy or lesser to greater, which is, if God cares about animals, does he not, how much more does he care about humanity? So if he wants this animal cared for, how much more does he want humanity cared for? So Paul's using it, the argument, hey look, if those who labor amongst you in the spiritual help them out in the physical, just like you would this ox. Okay, so it's, he's using an argument by analogy. Okay? But he's going back and he's picking up a principle that goes right back to the Torah, right back to Deuteronomy 25.4. Do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. So he's picking up on a principle that he then extrapolates to say, look, not a, does God care about only animals? No, do you write this only about animals? Anything that you can attribute to, any kind of commandment that you can attribute to God's care for animals, you can also attribute to God's care for humanity. He didn't write it just about animals. So he wants, he wants the oxen taken care of while it's working for you as well. And how relevant is this? We still have... We still have in the newspapers all the time places where animals are being abused and being misused. So it's still a relevant issue. So, but God cares about humanity. So Paul is quoting this verse to say, look, here's a principle here that goes just beyond the animals. It also goes to humanity. Any, other, any questions on this one? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yeah, you see his application. His, he's saying, look, you know, I'm reading, he's reading along in 25.4, and he's like, does God just care about oxen? Well, no. He cares about humanity as well. So if this is how God feels about these animals, that they should be allowed to feed while and benefit from the work they're doing, how much more so should, going from this argument of lesser to greater, if it's true in the lesser, then it's true in the greater. So he's making an argument that's rabbinic in its way of thinking, and he's applying this verse to that situation. A verse that seems, admittedly, very, very obscure. Seems out of context. I mean, when you're looking at... Sure. I, although I don't know anybody that takes it that way as far as the text, as far as Deuteronomy 25.4 is concerned. It seems that that's just, you know, this is God's concern for animals. I mean, because we have other places in the Hebrew Scripture where God shows concern for animals. Yeah. But it could be. That's possible. Right. 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 Financial support. Right. Yeah, very very much so. I think that's exactly what he's driving at. All right, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. By the way, anybody that's read 1 Corinthians knows that Corinth is a problem town. Okay, it's a problem area. So look at chapter 5 with me. Start with verse 1. He says, it, this is Paul speaking, 1 Corinthians 5. Now we're going to watch. I want you to look at how subtle Paul's, in this text, how he's drawing upon Deuteronomy, but you're, he's not going to tell us that he's doing so. This is what intrigues me about the, about the writers of the Apostolic Scripture is, they oftentimes will allude to or echo the Hebrew Scriptures without giving us any indication that they are doing so. They don't say things like, it is written, or, and Moses said. There's no tip-off that they're quoting or alluding to these scriptures. Because, I think, two reasons. For some of them, it was almost like, duh. You know, like, hello, don't we already all kind of know this? And I think another reason is that sometimes it's so ingrained that they just go right into it without really having to say, and oh, by the way, I'm quoting Scripture. Okay, so it's just kind of ingrained in them. But we don't see it because we're not ingrained with it. Let me show you one of those. We're, getting, we're coming to that right here. Look at this. Chapter 5, 1 Corinthians, verse 1. It is reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. Wow, that's bad. There's actually something going on that even the Gentiles think is kind of messed up. Here it is. That a man has his father's wife. All right, now where would we think, why would Paul think that this was wrong? I mean, what's his, what's his moral basis for thinking that this particular situation is wrong? Because he, he says, he calls it sexual immorality, not even the Gentiles. And what are we talking about here? Probably, probably a stepmother. Huh? Yes. His question was, wasn't Reuben guilty of this? And the answer is yes. So let's say... Your father and mother, you have your father and mother, your father and mother divorce, she remarries, and then her new husband dies, and so this, the son over here from this union, 
marries his mother. And Paul says, man, this is messed up. This is just whacked out. Even Gentiles don't even think that this is right. Okay, this is way too close. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, and I always think that Paul, I always think that Paul is addressing diaspora Jews, with a smattering of Gentiles included, but he's always focusing on his brothers in the faith who should understand these things. Okay, so where? Go with me to Leviticus chapter eighteen. Leviticus chapter eighteen. Then I'm going to show you where he's drawing from in Deuteronomy. But Leviticus chapter 18, and look at verse 7. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother, you shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. There you go. Okay, so there's at least one place where he's drawing from. Okay, now go with me to... Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23. There's a numbering issue in the Hebrew text. So in most of your Bibles, it's going to be verse 30 of chapter 22. Verse, 20, verse 30 of chapter 22. Here's what it says. A man shall not take his father's wife nor uncover his father's bed. Deuteronomy 22.30, or it could be 23.1, depending on your, your verse ordering. Now, let's continue, go, let's continue reading back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Go with me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I wanted you to get the basis for where Paul is coming from. He says this, verse 2, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he has done this deed, might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done so this, has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Yeshua Messiah, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Yeshua Messiah, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of Yeshua, of Messiah, of, of the Lord Yeshua. Your glorying is not good. Do, not, do you not, by the way, I mean, what, what's going on there? Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Okay, sounds like Paul is on board with some imprecatory psalms. Bring, in other words, um, some necessary judgment needs to fall here. Now look what he says, verse 6. I've already passed judgment on this. Why? Because he can look at the scriptures and say, this, is a, this situation is already messed up. Right. It's not, it's not a judgment if I can say, the, wor the Lord says this, and you're doing this, it's wrong. That's not, a, that's not me judging, that's the word judging you. That's the Lord's judgment. And Paul can just say, hey, look, if this is what you're doing, and this says you're not supposed to do it, and that's what you're doing, it's pretty clear, pretty cut and dry. There's no debate here. So I don't have to make a judgment if you're already admitting that you're doing wrong, based on the text. Now, look, let's continue on, verse 6. I want to watch what he says here. Now, now watch how he puts Deuteronomy. I'm going to show you some texts here, but they're fascinating. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Now he's referring to Passover. They would get rid of all their comets. Okay? So you got to, he's drawing upon imagery that they had of pre preparation for Passover. He says, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
<coughs> Verse 9. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Okay? He expects people in the world to be that way. Where he doesn't expect it to be is in the assembly of the righteous. Look at verse 11. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. If this is their lifestyle. Now look what he says. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Here he's going back to his earlier argument. Why would I judge the, those on the outside? I expect them to do that. It's an expectation that they're going to be these kinds of things. Continuing on, he says, Do you not judge those who are inside, but those who are outside God judges? God will judge those on the outside. That's up to them. That's, he'll deal with that. Therefore, now look what he says. And they don't even tell, he doesn't say it's a quote. Now, some of your Bibles will put it in italics. He says, put away from yourselves the evil person. <coughs> okay? Now, that's a quote, that's a reference to Deuteronomy. Let's talk about those. We're going to look at a couple of references. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Yes. Oops. Oops. That creates a problem. All right, look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 7. I'm just giving you the verses. You can go back and look at the context. I want to give you the verses. You can go back later and check out the context, but check this out. He says this, Deuteronomy 17, 7. The hands of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hands of all the people... So you shall put away the evil from among you. There's the phrase. So you shall put away the evil from among you. Okay? Now look at Deuteronomy 19, verse 19. Deuteronomy 19, verse 19. He says this, Then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother, so, so, so you shall put away the evil from among you. Okay? 2121 of Deuteronomy. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones, so you shall put away the evil from among you. Chapter 22, verse 21. He says, at the end of verse 21, so, so, you, so, so you shall put away the evil from among you. Verse 24 of the same chapter says, so you shall put away this evil from among you. And then verse 20, chapter 24, verse 7, end of verse 7, and you shall put away the evil from among you. Okay? And all of these are capital crime offenses. And Paul is pulling his language from Deuteronomy and saying, just as Deuteronomy said, you shall put these, this person away from you, you need to put this person away from you. God will judge the people on the outside. We expect them to behave that way. You need to judge the people on the inside who say they're believers and are operating by the text and are living an immoral lifestyle. Now, remember what we said. Now, now let's tie this together with going back to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Look at... Look at what happens here. Here's how Paul's tying this together. If you look at chapter 22, verse 30, a man shall, take his, shall not take his father's wife, nor uncover his father's bed. Now here's what's interesting. If you continue reading the next verse, he says this. He talks about those who can come into the assembly of the Lord. In verse 1 of chapter 23, the last phrase, the assembly of the Lord. Verse 2, the assembly of the Lord. Verse 3, the assembly of the Lord. Verse 
8. End of verse 8. The assembly of the Lord. He's talking about who could come into the assembly and who can't. So Paul has just, he's thinking in terms of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy says, here's who could come into the assembly of the Lord and here's who can't. And then he's saying, he's looking at Deuteronomy and he's saying, you shall put this, one, this evil from among you. Okay? And he's drawing, he's talking to the Corinthians, applying Deuteronomic thinking about who belongs in the assembly and who doesn't, and who shall be judged and who shouldn't, and who should be dealt with and how they should be dealt with. And he's drawing upon the theology of both Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So Paul has not abandoned it one, one whit. In fact, he's applying it to the situation here in Corinth and saying, hey, look, I expect people in the world to act a certain way. God will judge them. But if people in the assembly, and he's thinking in terms of those who can be in and those who can be out, from Deuteronomy 22, to end of 22 to beginning of 23, if, if this is going on in the assembly, they know what Leviticus and Deuteronomy says is right and moral. And if they're going to continue living in this lifestyle, then you need to put, them, put this evil from, from you. Yes? No. Right. It has nothing to do with, I can't judge another person's heart as to, as to issues of faith. But what I can judge is a person's actions. And if a person says, you know, I'm going to continue living a life that's immoral. I'm going to continue living in an immoral situation. I can then say, this is how God has judged it. And as, and as, as God's representative, this is how you should be dealt with. If, right. And notice what Paul says. You put them outside the assembly. Why? Because they don't belong in the assembly if they're going to act like if they're going to live a lifestyle of the people that are on the outside, then you put them out there where they belong. Because that's what those people out there do. And God will judge them. You have to deal with those on the inside. Now, I'm going to hold you accountable if the people on the inside continue doing stuff like the people on the outside. Because now I'm responsible to make sure that they're told that this is wrong. And that they have Leviticus and Deuteronomy to say, this is not a moral lifestyle. <clears throat> this, okay, so this is situations that are continuing to go on in the world where they want to bring, well, I was at a, I was at a, I'll leave it this way. I went to visit a church. And on the, on the, in one of the hallways, I got there early. In one of the hallways, there was a picture, and this is not unusual for people to have pictures of their former pastors, you know, on the wall. So I'm there looking at these pictures, just kind of viewing them, and the pastor of the, of the church at the time says to me, as I'm looking at this one picture of the last pastor there, he says, yes, he says, that was our last pastor. He came out of the closet after he left. Everybody in the church, he says, knew that this guy was married with a, to a woman, but had a liaison relationship with a, with a man at the same time. And everybody was kind of like, well, that's just, we're fine with that. That he's, he's allowed to have, he's allowed to step outside of his marriage, first of all, and break his covenant with his wife, and then he, that he's able to do this with another man. Not that if he'd done it with a woman, it would have been any better. Both are still sins, both are still wrong, both are still judged. But the fact that a community of faith would basically say, oh well, eh, live and let live. So what? Hey, que sera, sera. Why can't he have, you know, why can't he do both? Who are we to judge? Who are we to judge? And Paul says, you are to judge. If the, if the scripture says it's wrong, and they're in the community of faith, I'm not worried about, I don't expect people to act a right way that are on the outside. I'm not holding this standard to people out there. I expect, in fact, I expect them to live that way. 
And you know what? They will come under the judgment of God. He'll deal with them on an individual basis or corporate basis. However, he'll deal with them. But if they're in the community of faith already, hey, look, I had a guy one time. Somebody came up to me and said, they were very upset with me, and they said, how come you're letting so-and-so live in sin? I said, well, first of all, I didn't know they were living in sin. So I can't be held guilty for it if I don't know. There was a man and woman. They looked to be in their mid-50s. They came in and they sat together. I made the assumption they were married. And they left to get, they came in the same car, they left together, and they sat together during the service. So I said, so this lady said to me, well, how come you're, you know, she's pointing her, wagging her finger at me, how come you're letting so-and-so live in sin? Thought you cared about this. I said, well, this is the first I've heard about it. So I went with another individual, talked to this individual in his house and said, you know, what's the situation? Well, we're, not, we're just living together, we're both divorced, we just decided to live together. I said, well, not going to work, you need to get married. Have some form of mar- marriage contract. You can't live together, you can't just shack up together. You can't just decide that you want to live together without, a, without two things. If it's your first time being married, you have to have your father's permission. Numbers chapter 30. And you also have to have a covenant agreement signed by witnesses. That's all you have to have. Covenant document signed by witnesses. And the, if it's the first time the girl's getting married, her father's consent. Numbers chapter 30 says, if a woman enters into an oath, any oath, to God, to God, and her father hears about it, he can annul it on the day he hears it. So again, arguing from the lesser to the greater, if he can annul, if a father can annul the vow of a daughter to God, he can annul the vow of a daughter to a man. Therefore, you get the father's consent. The one thing I ask for on every ketuvah is that the father somewhere sign it, either on the front or the back. That way I know he is voluntarily giving his daughter over. And that there be a covenant document with, with witnesses. Other than that, that's all I ask. That's what the scripture asks. I don't care if you have I don't care if you wear a white gown. I don't care if you have a cake. I don't care if you have a big hall. I don't care if you have bridesmaids. I don't care if, none of that stuff matters per se. It's all nice and fluffy. It's wonderful. Fluffy. Fluffy. That's an official technical word. <laughs> fluffy. I'm thinking more about the cake. But that doesn't... It's a rare word. It's a rare word. That's a very rare word. Fluffy is a very rare word. But you don't have to have all the pomp and circumstance. It's nice if you have all the pomp and circumstance. That's wonderful. And we can make a big occasion of it. We can all dress up. And, but what's biblically required... And they didn't want to do that. All I said to them was, have a piece of paper that says, I'm marrying, Bob is marrying Sue, covenant, sign, witnesses, and if there's a father involved, because it's the first time, after the, hey, after the first wedding, she's a free agent, according to the Torah. If she's divorced, if she's widowed, she's a free agent. She can make her own decision at that point. But she still has to have a covenant document with witnesses. That's all that's all. Okay, go ahead, sorry. Well, let me go take a little further here. If they're both divorced, should they be together in the first place? Depends on the circumstances of their divorce. Yeah, that's right. It would depend on the circumstances of their divorce. And by the way, I think you could add this. Now, the Apostle Paul, here's again, he's pulling upon Deuteronomy. When he talks about marriage, when he talks about unequally yoked, he's going back, he's using, he's using a, meta, a parallel. Again, this argument from the lesser to the greater, when he says... You don't put an ox and a donkey together to plow in the field. Why? The ox is stronger than the donkey, and the ox will pull the donkey. And they're going to fight each other. And rather than that, you have two oxen or two donkeys because they're of equal strength. If they're not, if you don't have that, they are, to put it in Paul's terms, unequally yoked. And he says, then the, those who remarry should remarry in the Lord. Had a lady one time tell me, sitting here again. I'm sitting across her from her, and she says to me, I said, Well, tell me about your, your past relationships. She says, Well, I've been married twice before and divorced. 
okay, that can happen. I said, well, what's the situation that you're currently getting into? She says, well, I'm going to marry a guy. I said, is he a believer? She says, I don't think so. I said, why are you even thinking about marrying him? She says, well, why wouldn't I? I said, because you just told me that he wasn't a believer. And Paul says you have to remarry in the Lord. You can't be unequally yoked. And she says, well, she says to me, I don't, know, I don't care about all that. She says, the, the Holy Spirit told me I could marry him, and therefore it's fine. And so how do I trump the Spirit? If the Spirit tells her it's okay for her to marry this guy, then who am I to tell her she needs to marry a fellow believer? So this is the point. This is why we need to know. The reason we need to know the Word is because if we don't know the Word, then we really don't know what the Spirit is telling us. That's the only way we can test the Spirit's. We've gotten about halfway through. I'm sorry. We'll get to the others later. But anyway, all right, yes. Right. Tied together, yes. Right. Yeah, and I think my my point with Paul here is that he's in First Corinthians five is he's saying, look, the community can judge when it's based on the lifestyle of a person who's not following the biblical text. Then the text judges them. God judges them in the text because of their actions, their continual actions. And those individuals should be set out. If they're going to continue to live an unrepentant, immoral lifestyle, they should be set outside the congregation. If it's continual, repetitive, unrepentant. Now, he says he doesn't expect this activity. He does expect this activity of those outside. If they remain outside a community, that's different. But once they come into a community of faith, and he's using the phraseology here, from Deuteronomy. And my point is this, at the very end of 1 Corinthians, 2 1 Corinthians 5, he's quoting, uh, he's quoting lines that come repeatedly in Deuteronomy. And thus you shall put away the evil from you. 